Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of In Conversation uh, Live. I'm Roger Kirby, President of the Royal Society of Medicine. Well, this evening, I'm so pleased to say that uh, we have an absolute star performer, Sir Paul Maxime Nurse, English geneticist, former president of the Royal Society, chief executive, executive and director of the Francis Crick Institute. He was awarded the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physiology for the discoveries of protein molecules that to control division of cells in the cell cycle, the so-called CDK1 gene. Paul, you are most welcome. Uh, it's absolutely lovely to speak to you. I can see in your background, you're actually in the Crick Institute uh, today. Paul, let's um, welcome. Let's start off with, with that Nobel Prize, and then we'll go backwards in time, a bit like they do on Desert Island Discs, and uh, talk through you know, how, you, how you got to be where you are. But Let's start off with that 2001 Nobel Prize. Can, can you explain to me and to the audience um, a bit more about that CDK1 gene? You know, tell us the story. Yes, well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Roger, um, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, the Nobel Prize was um, given to uh, three people, Tim Hunt, Lee Hartwell, and myself, and we all um, contributed in different ways to identifying um, what uh, can be seen as or considered as the major regulators of the um, cell cycle, cell reproduction of all eukaryotic cells. It's a, a universal mechanism. Um, it's a, a set of protein kinases. These are enzymes that phosphorylate other proteins and enzymes and phosphorylation results in putting a sort of bulky negative charge onto those proteins and changing as a consequence the structure of them so it can either activate other proteins or inactivate them. So these protein kinases are like switches that switch behavior. And the cyclin dependent kinases of which CDK1 is, uh, is the um, archetype regulate progression through the cell cycle. They were discovered in, in yeast, um, in two yeasts actually, Lee Hartwell in budding yeast and my work in, in fission yeast. We, um, we did it by genetics, um, getting mutations in yeast and um, just analyzing them um, by genetics, classical genetics really, because it was before cloning when that, when that happened. I was only in my 20s. And it, um, that demonstrated or established that these controlled the rate of progression through the cell cycle, through the two major events of the cell cycle, which is S phase when chromosomes are copied, DNA is replicated, and then mitosis when the replicated chromosomes separate. So it's a key, key uh, set of processes that are common to all um, uh, dividing cells. The exciting thing about it was, although these were discovered in, in, in yeast, um, they turned out to be um, the, the same controls operating in all other eukaryotic cells, including um, human cells. And that uh, my lab did uh, with an experiment where we took uh, a yeast cells defective in the key gene, CDK1, sprinkled on it essentially a gene library, a human gene library, the very first one that had been made, uh, a cDNA library, and within actually a month or two of it being made, it was made in Stanford, um, very generously given to me. And uh, what I was trying to do was to see um, whether there was a gene in, um, in, in humans that could rescue the defective gene in yeast, showing that the same system worked. I did that with uh, Melanie Lee, a postdoc in my, in my lab. She did um, uh, nearly all the actual work. And that experiment that frankly had no right to work, did work, um, even though there's probably 1,500 million years evolutionary divergence. And so there under the microscope, we saw um, these defective fission yeast cells um, using the human gene to um, uh, uh, control their own reproduction and progression through the cell cycle. So that's that's what it was all about, Roger. Great. And that work was done in which laboratory up in Scotland, was it? Well, it was done in several places because um, I didn't have a proper job at the time. And I had I had to keep moving around to be perfectly um, to perfectly honest. But I started it 
in um, Switzerland, in Bern, where I was learning yeast genetics. I did um, six, seven years, seven years in Edinburgh, and my a fantastic, uh, generous boss there, Murdoch Mitchison. Um, then I went to the University of Sussex and started um, molecular genetics to clone the gene, and finally did the experiments I just described in the old Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London, um, what became the London Research Institute of, of Cancer Research UK. So it was in all of those places right. that um, parts of this story were put together. And when, where, where was it published, the, the, the kind of key paper? I'm sure there are several papers, but uh, I should know this actually, but uh, actually I don't. Well, generally, I mean, there, there were about 10 papers that were necessary for this, 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 this uh, project. Um, several of them were in Nature and in Cell, but a number of them in, in um, less high profile journals, genetics journals, cell biology journals. I mean, people weren't tremendously interested in yeast, to be perfectly honest, Roger. I yeah. mean, you know, it's just um, something that infects you and um, useful for making wine and, um, and beer and bread. Um, but when we showed that it was exactly the same process in human cells, it became a very popular topic. So there wasn't a sort of seminal paper like the Watson and Crick paper that um, kind of... I would say there, it, there wasn't a single one. I would say there were um, three or four. I think that the two that were critical, I suppose, was the, the first one, which I published as a, an article in Nature, and I was the sole author, actually, um, where I got a mutant in, 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 in yeast that was accelerated through the cell cycle. It went through the cell cycle more rapidly the normal and what i reasoned was that meant it was like a, an accelerator in a car and it was therefore probably encoding the, the um a protein that regulated the overall progression through the cycle that turned out to be case the case and unlocked that particular uh, um key problem and then the second major experiment that was also in nature was the one where we we cloned the human gene long before the human genome was sequenced and so on by this functional assay. Yeah, yeah. And, and this was in your 20s and 30s, so it must have been tremendously exciting for you to kind of make this discovery. I mean, did you realise how important it was? And did you realise that it was like Nobel Prize winning uh, material? It was done in my um, 20s and 30s. So um, what I just described to you was before I was 40. Um, I knew it was important. I um, certainly wasn't thinking it would get a Nobel Prize. I then began to uh, be awarded prizes from um, the age 40 onwards. And the, the sort of precursor prizes which lead up to a Nobel Prize. And I, I won a number of those. So I, I began to realize that um, I, was, I was probably being looked at. And indeed I was being looked at. I, I remember in my early forties, I was invited to Stockholm and, and spoke to um, the um, Nobel in the Karolinska where the Nobel committee sits. What happened is they decided they were going to award the Nobel prize um, in, in this area. And I was gonna be one of them when I was oh, about 45, 44. Um, and then um, they were finalizing it. They got to that position two or three years later. And then they did say to me, I don't know if it's really true. They held it back for a year or two because I actually got it on the hundredth anniversary of the Nobel prize, the biggest party they ever had. Was that 2001, right? 2001 was a hundred years yeah. after the Nobel had been been founded yeah and and looking back i mean is that your proudest achievement you've done a whole load of other things that we're actually going to come on to but i mean is that the thing that defines sir paul nurse or other other things well um, i i have to talk about my children and daughters and so yeah, on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. professionally yes yeah 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 i mean to have that under your belt i mean they do say that if you don't achieve you know uh, in, in science, if you, if you don't discover something really amazing before the age of 40, then you're unlikely to do it as it beyond that. But I'm, I don't know whether that's true or not, probably. I think it is absolutely true for the physical sciences, a bit less so for the uh, biological, biomedical sciences, um, but absolutely true for the physical sciences. 
Mm. Okay, so let's go back to the, your amazing childhood and the kind of revelation that I, I, I never knew about this till I started doing a bit of research on you <laughs> today. But I kind of sat up bolt upright in my chair when I read uh, the beginning of your Wikipedia entry. And I'm, if you just, could, do you mind telling us about this? You're happy to talk about this? I'm perfectly happy to talk about it and what you're referring to um is my own genetic origins um i i was um brought up in a, a, um, a fairly simple household working class family in northwest london in wembley um and um and uh, you know my dad worked in a, a, a factory in uh, um uh, keeping the machines going my mum was a cleaner and um i was the only one of my two brothers and my sister um, as I thought they were at the time, um, who stayed on at school after the age of 15. And I did, I was actually not great at exams. I went up and down all, all the time, but I did better than um, the rest of my family and did end up going to university and so on. And I often wondered um, why I am that happened. Anyway, much, much later, much, much later, I applied for a green card in the United States. I was president of Rockefeller University, which is a research university in New York City. And I applied for a green card and they rejected me. Now, I have to say, I was rather, um, uh, I rather admired Homeland Security because at the time I had a Nobel Prize, I was knighted and I was president of, a, of one of the great American universities. Um, and they rejected me because uh, the bureaucrat didn't like my birth certificate, which was a so-called short birth certificate, um, which didn't name my parents, but named uh, my, where I was born and, and, and my nationality and so on. So I cursed them a bit, wrote to the registry office in London, got the birth certificate, the, the, the complete birth certificate, uh, which had been sitting there for um, 50 years. This is when I was about 55. And, uh, and when I... <laughs> When I opened it, um, the name of my mother was not my mother. It was my sister. And what had happened is that my sister had got pregnant at 17. She obviously wasn't my sister um, and was sent to her aunt like a Victorian novel, sent to her aunt in Norwich, which is where I was born, um, gave birth to me. Her mother, my grandmother, came up to Norwich and pretended that she was the mother to protect <laughs> her daughter because it was you know a great shame 1949 you know it was shameful at the time came back with me I was never formally adopted I mean this couldn't happen these days and I was brought up by my grandparents pretending to be my parents and um, my my mother and it was no tragedy for me I mean it but it was I'm sure for my mother who died actually before uh, we could have the conversation about this and she she left um home at two and a half when i was two and a half not when she was two and a half um, when i was two and a half got married to somebody um and in there's a wedding photograph which i always noted but it's poignant she's holding the hand of her new husband in one hand and my hand <laughs> at, the, at the other hand because she was leaving home and leaving me leaving right. me with her, her, her parents. All of this was kept quiet and silent from me for 50 years. And as I said at the beginning, the irony is I'm, I'm quite a good geneticist, but I hadn't got a clue about my own genetics. <laughs> and, and when you made that discovery, Fred, I mean, was it like a tremendous shock? Like, or how, how did you respond emotionally to the, this discovery? Well, yes, it is, Roger. It's quite a shock, I have to say. But I can't it, imagine anything more shocking, actually, really. But it wasn't disturbing. You need to know, I had a perfectly happy childhood, a bit dull. I used to, you won't even believe it, I used to joke, it's a bit like being brought up by my grandparents, I used to say. What I didn't fully appreciate was I was being brought up by my grandparents. But it was perfectly, perfectly happy. Um, and... Um, but it was shocking because suddenly everybody in my family changed position. Yeah. It, it, it's a bit different from an adoption and so on, which uh, it occurs because suddenly my mother, um, my sister becomes my mother, my mother becomes my grandmother, my brothers became my uncles. 
and it just goes on. And I, ever since then, I start calling them both because, you know, you know so I say my, you, you know, my sister mother, I just, it's, <laughs> to try and sort of keep my mind focused on yeah. my previous life as well as my present one. And you never found out who your dad was? No, um, I, um, I, I didn't, I haven't. I, I, I've taken a, a DNA, I've, I've actually had my genome sequence. We, when the Queen opened the Crick Institute, where I am now, I, I got her to um, switch on a DNA sequencing machine. I originally had the idea that she, we could sequence her DNA, but I thought I'll end up in the Tower of London, so I, I, I shouldn't do that. Then I thought of her corgis, and then somebody said, well, it's safer just to do you. So she switched on the machine that sequenced me. She said, um, as, as she did it, she said, I hope hope you don't find out anything you don't want to know, is what she, <laughs> what she told me. Very amusing. Anyway, um, what have I, I've also done a 23andMe type test, the sort of ancestry DNA in actual fact. And yeah. what that has revealed, it revealed that I have two um, relatives, a first cousin um, genetic relationship, who live in the UK, and I have no idea who they are. So they are almost certainly related to my father. Now, I did try and contact them through the website, but they didn't respond. And I didn't want to push it any further because these are quite delicate matters for people. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm, I, I could find it out if I was um, perhaps more aggressive about it, but I decided not to since they didn't really want to respond to my my request and uh, your mum mother must have died quite young then before, did she, she died uh, just before she was 70 of multiple sclerosis yes it's true right. a year actually two years before a year or two before i found out yeah about yeah this. i mean it's interesting because it's sort of nature versus nurture thing isn't it because yeah you had the same upbringing as the uh, as as uh, the other people that your grandparents brought up but yeah you, you did a lot better, which kind of suggests that the genetic material that came from your dad was uh, different from, oh, well, obviously it's different, but it maybe it may, maybe a brilliant scientist that had, had a, a liaison with your 18 year old mum and then disappeared. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I, I have a feeling it just may not be like that at all, that maybe it will just be somebody down the street and it's all just <laughs> luck, you know? Um, I am intrigued. And yeah. I, I would quite like to find out, but um, I'm, I'm really have not a clue quite yeah. what would emerge from it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're terribly open about it, and uh, it, it is absolutely fascinating. Well, listen, there's so many things um, to talk about. There's one question. Let me have a look at that. Exciting family tree. Just need clarity. <laughs> uh, uh, Kamal Shukla say. Let's talk about um, your your little sojourn in New York. I'm in mean, New York City is an amazing place isn't it it's such a buzzy city but sort of exhausting i i spent a few months there for various reasons and i kind of love it but uh i prefer london i suppose but you when you're in at rockefeller which is a massively well endowed university isn't it i mean they've got it so is. Much it's the richest the richest university per capita i mean per faculty member in the world by far far right. richer than harvard or stanford or whatever yeah so you're in in the world, one of the world's most famous cities, working in the best endowed university for seven years. I mean, why did you come back to oh, good old London? Well, when I, I I had no intention of going to uh, to uh, Rockefeller, New York. They headhunted me. I, I didn't follow up on it, and then. I felt rude, and so I went over. I was interviewed. They offered me the job. It, it was um, a, a very good offer. Um, they would pay for my research in the Institute because they, they were so um, wealthy. Um, it was a very small university. There was only um, 100 faculty. I mean, we, it wouldn't be a university in this country. It's a, it'd be a research institute. There were eight Nobel laureates, or seven before I went there, on the faculty, seven before I came, eight when I went there. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's wow. extraordinary. Wow. And so a very much a powerhouse. Um, and I, I said I would go for a period of between five and seven years. I stayed eight. Um, it is an, ex I mean, New York's really exciting, but um, they treated me very well. I had a, 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 a freestanding house with grounds came with the job overlooking the East River on Manhattan, I mean, can you imagine it? The house was was valued at sixty five million dollars. I mean, you, you it, I mean, it's just 
utterly, utterly absurd. And uh, I had a tremendous time there, really enjoyed it. But I was always going to come back. And um, then I was um, elected to the presidency of the Royal Society, which is a big deal for um, a, a, sci for a scientist, as, uh, as I'm sure you, you would appreciate. And it's quite amusing because my, the chairman of the board, when I said I was going to leave, he looked at me and he said, whatever they're offering you, I'll double it, he said. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, it's an unpaid job. <laughs> In America, nobody <laughs> begins to understand such mm. things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I did come back and, and, uh, and had a great time at the Royal Society too. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's talk uh, a little bit. I, I, th I think the Royal Society. Um, let's talk about that because it's that's a sort of mysterious place. That um, I mean, my my predecessor, Sir Simon Wesley, I think you know quite well, a bit of a character, yeah. enormous character actually, uh, has just been elected a member. And he was so happy. It's that it's like the biggest day in his life to just just be to join the the uh, Royal Society. And I actually have to say, my dad was posthumously. He died quite young, uh, made him a member. Of, so tell us a bit about the Royal Society for people who don't know what a special organisation it is. Well, it's um, the uh, Britain's National Academy for Science, of course. Um, it, uh, it's for scientists, but it also has um, some engineers, some medics. I mean, but we now have um, academies, um, Academy of Medical Sciences and the Royal Academy for Engineering, um, which looks after the, uh, those categories, although those who have done high quality science are still elected in the Royal Society, so it covers um, science. It was um, almost the earliest academy that was founded, Science Academy, uh, uh, founded in um, 1660, Actually, Galileo founded um, uh, the Lynche, the Lynx, it's called, um, uh, about 40 years before, but it then collapsed. So it's, it, the Royal Society has been in existence since 1660. We ran on the 1662 charter until 2012 when I did update it. I was the first one to actually ever update it in, um, when I was president. And because um, it has all sorts of things to do about serving God and so on as part of my job, which wasn't entirely appropriate for, um, in, um, in, in many cases. And it is a mysterious thing. It is a society that has almost no power, but a lot of influence. Yeah. And um, in, in government circles, it does depend on the government, it must be said, and, and whether the government's going to take much notice or not does vary um uh, from government to government but um usually the government will not do very much to change science or even teaching of science or research without um consultation with the royal society and um so it has influence but almost no power um it elects itself it spends a lot of time electing new fellows um it it, it was what I wanted to be when I became a scientist. I thought if I'm really, really, really successful, I'll perhaps be made a fellow of the Royal Society. And yeah. that was what I aimed at. And it was a big it was a big thing for me as well when I was elected. And it, it, and I enjoyed very much um, being president. I, I had a you know, I had this great house in New York, but I had a, a the flat over the Royal Society overlooking the Mall. When yeah. I came back, I now have a one bedroom flat in Clerkenwell, by the way, next to Sadler as well. So I've come down in the world. Um, <laughs> it's based in Mayfair, isn't it? In, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the street. It, it's, it's in Carlton House Terrace and it overlooks the mall. So whenever there's any sort of royal event or whatever, you just go out on the balcony and it all goes out in front of you. <laughs> a couple of comments coming through. Leslie Fallowfield, who did one of these interviews, if you were. Uh, months ago says, please ask Paul to come back to Sussex University. My team are working on the psychosocial aspects of genetics, and I'm pleased to give him an office in my unit. <laughs> <laughs> and David Cochran says, did you meet Gordon Brown when you were working in Edinburgh? He might have been the, the rector. Uh, he, he, he was doing an MSc at, around that time. He absolutely was. I knew of him, but I didn't meet him. I did meet him later, actually. In fact, he was a major uh, influence on allowing the cricket Institute to be um, uh, to be founded. I went to see him in Downing Street. It, it belonged to the British Library and therefore the land that it, the Crick is built on. And um, it, we spoke 
for some time about it. And in the end, I got it for half price. I mean, it was still 75 million, but I mean, um, it was for half price. But I didn't meet Gordon at the time. I met him frequently. He's a big um, supporter of science, actually. And uh, um, he, he and a, a charming man, one to one, for sure. Yeah. Well, tell us about the founding of the Crick Institute, um, because, I, you know, it's, it, it's probably now one of the most prominent research units in the whole UK. But was it were you the, the mover and shaker that got it going? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I was. Um, it, it had a long gestation. It started in uh, in 2000, 2001, when I first um, had the idea that we should merge some of the London institutes, in particular, um, the MRC's National Institute of Medical Research out at Mill Hill and the London Research Institute of Cancer Research UK, as it was by then, which was in um, Lincoln's Inn Fields next to the Royal College of Surgeons and um, out at South Mims, there was a smaller a smaller unit called Clare Hall. And um, they, we, we had problems with all three of those buildings um, uh, that were clearly coming up. And I had this mad idea, and it really was a mad idea. You all remember the Millennium Dome and nobody knew what to do with it. Right. And I had this crazy idea we could put an institute in it, okay? And um, we, we could merge them all. Now, um, the MRC thought this was mad and barely talked about it, and it just collapsed. Quite some years later, when I was in New York, 2007, 2008, Keith Peters, who um, was then acting director of NIMR, um, he contacted me when I was in New York um, about this idea and said that um, it, it, maybe this could be tried again because um, there, uh, there were potential sites, and this was one of them, in, in central London. At that time, NI, NIMR was basically going to be hugely contracted and moved to um, a, a site um, close to UCL, but it was going to lose 75% of its staff. And so I then um, started visiting from New York and um, put together um, with, um, with Keith um, a, a package that got um, a University College um, Cancer Research UK and um, the Medical Research Council together mm -hmm. and they agreed they'd put something up. I then worked on the Wellcome Trust um, who put in a smaller sum of money, quite a lot smaller in terms of running costs, so that we had the three major funders. I was desperate to get the other two main universities in London involved and so spent a lot of time negotiating with Imperial College and King's College and eventually got them on board, so six founders. And all this sort of came together in about 2010, something of that sort, which right. is when we uh, um, had raised or were beginning to uh, raise all the money and to get the building designed and so on. So uh, it had its origins nearly 20 years ago, and then serious discussions about um, 14, 15 years ago, a long time, in other words, to get it up and going. Yeah, wow. And you had a, I mean, you must have had a fundraising team to help you raise, because you raised quite a bit of money outside this, just the major funders you've already mentioned, didn't you? We did. Um, Cancer Research UK fundraisers um, raised, um, they, they put in about 150 million, 160 million. They got quite a lot for their old building, actually. Um, um, something like 70 million. And they, 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 they raised, um, over 100 million so it's a significant sum there and um, the MRC uh, got it from government um, uh, in addition to their normal budget so it didn't come out of the science budget and that was uh, about another 250 million and then um, the welcome put in 100 million so they that was capital the three universities put in 40 million each and have a certain amount of space here and then the running money comes from uh, Cancer Research UK that puts in 55 million. These are large sums. MRC 50 million in the end, and uh, Wellcome Trust 15 million, one five. So they're our major core funders. Yeah, well, I say, I mean, you cut almost a billion, aren't you? Well, um, yeah, yeah in, cap in the capital and everything. It is certainly a billion dollars anyway. Yeah, wow. And and um, the the uh, we talked a bit, a bit about Cancer Research UK. But you were also involved, another, another of your uh, achievements was that merger 
of the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, isn't that? I mean, I, I've in a much, much smaller way, I was involved in the mergers that created Prostate Cancer UK. And I know, as we were discussing earlier, I know the difficulties in getting charities to merge because, I mean, it's politics plus, 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 and a lot of, of unhappiness comes with having to sort of shed trustees right, left and centre. So tell us through that story, how, how you pulled that off. Well, I share your pain, if you like, Roger, because I know yeah. exactly yeah. what you went through. Well, I was then, at the time I was in charge of, can of uh, ICRF, um, CR you, um, a cancer research campaign um, and was a, a bit smaller than ICRF. But what was happening was we were competing for the same funds, essentially. And it wasn't always healthy because um, the, the fundraisers would get a bit competitive one with another. And that isn't a good way and comfortable way of, of working. The ICRF and CRC um, split. They were once a single organization, ICRF, um, and split, I think, in the 1920s. And so I, I did have this idea, we should just try and put them back together again. And I went and saw Gordon McVie, um, who was the director of cancer, uh, uh, cancer at CRC, Cancer Research Campaign. And um, he, he was interested in the idea. Then we got into the trustees and it was a long negotiation. And these things often don't work very well, as you, as you know, very complicated. Anyway, in the end, what happened is that I was um, appointed the um, uh, chief executive, as they called it, um, but the um, CRC trustees said you could you could have it for either one year or two years. I forget quite what it was now. Put the organisation to go, and then you have to leave, so we can start afresh without um, either one of the founding organisations dominating. And that's when I went to Rockefeller because I lost my job here in um, uh, Cancer Research UK. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean. Cancer Research UK raises, is it 500 million a yep. year now? 500 million. And when I and when it was made, when we put it together, um, I can tell you it was the, the, the total um, between the two was, uh, was less than 100 million. Yeah. So, so I mean, wow, that's uh, that, that is uh, a tribute to you. The interesting question from Christopher Woodhouse. I, I get criticized sometimes for the letting my pals ask the questions but Christopher is a is a real pal uh, he says can would you be indiscreet and tell us which um, governments do and which governments do not listen to the Royal Society <laughs> <laughs> um I don't think it goes with politics I mean actually most of the time I've been involved with the Royal Society it's been a conservative government um I did work um a bit before that with um, with Blair and Brown's government, but not as part of the Royal, Royal Society. Uh, I think it, so it doesn't go with, with politics. I think it goes with um, the, the individuals involved. So for example, um, the, uh, there are enthusiasts for science. Gordon Brown was one on the, uh, on, on the Labour side. Um, uh, uh, George Osborne in um, the, the was the who was the Chancellor, not the Prime Minister, which is Cameron, of course, was a, a big supporter of science. And in actual fact, Boris is a supporter of science. I mean, probably courtesy of Dominic Cummings. Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly is talking the talk. We have to see whether they walk the walk, um, but um, certainly talking the talk about it. And uh, so uh, it does depend on the individuals and whether there's somebody up there um, in uh, senior positions in the cabinet who is pro-science. And if that's the case, then you can have quite a lot of, um, of influence. Well, you, you, you mentioned uh, the Boris word, um, and that means the Brexit word. So Brexit and science, I mean, is it a calamity or what do you well, think? Well, I was, I was um, very much against Brexit. I, I think um, for both um, science and also economic terms, because I, I mean, the economic one I'll just deal with. I mean, we've got a big local uh, market and we've turned our back on it and we're, we're gonna find it a tough time, I think, as a consequence. When it comes to science, um, We've gained a lot from the closer relations with um, with continental Europe in the uh, in my lifetime over the last 30, 40 years. 
And I think scientists are pretty nervous that those links will be weakened. And um, it makes us um, somewhat impoverished in, our, our, in the impact we can have, because what was happening, and I've worked a lot with the, with the European Commission and with European fundings, is that um, it, with a population of 350 million, with a very significant support, very big budgets going into science, and the UK being bluntly the um, um, uh, premier um, scientific country in Europe, I mean, obviously there's very powerful other countries um you know germany france um scandinavian countries um and but we had a lot of influence and um now we've we, we've lost it and so uh, we, we're we're running a little bit adrift having said all of that we are where we are so there's no point moaning about it we have just got to get on with it and um and, and try and maintain the links and uh, at the moment we're tenuously hanging in there and we've got a budget that will get us through the first year to maintain the links. And um, we've just got to try and um, ensure we can get the budget in, in, in the future. So we have to work where, where we are. I'm, I'm always um, uh, feeling we have to look forward and being optimistic about that. Um, but it, it isn't really fully ideal. Uh, by the way, of course, not all the major institutions are European uh, Union ones. I mean, uh, CERN, for example, the big accelerator is outside the European Union. EMBL, and I'm chair of their scientific advisory committee, is outside the European Union. But they do get funding from the European Union, um, and which is, um, but they're not part of it. So it's a complicated landscape for sure. Okay, well, so Humphrey Scott, um, thank, he's our dean actually at the um, Royal Society of Medicine. H Humphrey says, why is there a red rocket behind you on your left shoulder? He says, are you planning to join Richard Branson and do a little trip out to space? No, I'm not. It's actually from Tintin. <laughs> and I, I got an honorary degree in um, in Belgium and it was given to me as a present. So it's there. That's why. So it's Tintin's rocket. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's talk a little bit about your your chancellor of Bristol University. I mean, that's that's quite a big job, isn't it? Isn't the chancellor supposed to raise loads of money for the university? You know, it isn't. I, I, I have to say, I um, uh, Winston Churchill was chancellor there for 32 uh, years. And throughout the entire Second World War, he was chancellor. So if he could have done it then, uh, um, I, uh, with all his other jobs that he had to do, of course, um, it is not a heavy job. I, I had been asked whether I'd consider chancellorships in other universities, and they did want too much work, as, as you said, fundraising, chairing the major mm -hmm. committees. Bristol doesn't work like that. It is entirely honorific. Um, essentially, I, I go along, um, I wear Winston Churchill's gown, which is full of gold and uh, 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 lacing, and um, he and I give out degrees um, for a couple of ceremonies a year. It's a very light load, and they do ask me to do certain things sometimes, and I do do it, but it is not onerous. It really isn't. That's interesting. Well, listen, your rocket is red, but so is your politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us, <laughs> I mean, you, you're a long-standing supporter of the Labour Party. I mean, let's... Uh, Let's have your insights. What do you think? Where are the Labour Party now? Do you like well, Keir Starmer? What did you think yeah. of Jeremy? Um, yeah, etc. <laughs> well, I, I, I have been a member of the Labour Party um, for 40 years, actually. I, I came, I told you, from a working class family. And um, I, you know, I was I was a baby of the National Health Service, 1949. Um, you know, all, my, my grandparents, I mean, who I taught my parents, they had all their teeth out because they were told it was cheaper to do that. I mean, outrageous things happened before, you know, we got this social support, which uh, a lot came in place from after 1945 through um, to 1950. And I, I just felt um, that that really sort of influenced me. And um, so that, that's why um, I've, I've been uh, um, a member there. Um, I think Jeremy Corbyn was a total disaster. I think that Keir Starmer is an immensely decent person he's actually the mp in which the crick is uh, 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 is stated immensely decent um highly intelligent wants to do the best um for for everybody he for some he doesn't have the same charisma as 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 boris 
but I think we could do with um, perhaps a bit less charisma and a bit more straightness um, and, um, and analysis of, of the situation so I, uh, that we're facing. So um, I'm a supporter of Keir, for sure. Having said that, I work, I've told you, most of the time with conservative governments, and I get on very well with them. Um, yeah, yeah. I get on well with Boris. And, uh, you know, everybody has their qualities. So I'm not you know, I'm not extreme in any sense. I'm rather boring, actually. So I'm more sort of left of centre than um, than dark red like that. A bit more the colour of my shirt, maybe. <laughs> well, you have in your job, you have to be a politician because you need the you know in order to kind of uh, work your way through all the all the different uh, aspects of of funding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, you, you couldn't create what you created without being a good politician. And and we have we have to forgive Michael Gove for saying you know, we've had enough of experts. Uh, <laughs> he, he's kind of uh, at the moment off the scene, isn't he? We don't, we don't hear much from him anymore. Um, we, we don't actually. I, I actually met him and Dominic Cummings um, right. when I was president of Royal Society because um, uh, then Don was um, advising on education and Gove was the um, secretary of state, and they were wanting to talk about science education. So I did meet them both together at that time, not since, however. Okay, I got a question from David French. Thank you, David. Um, not going to have time to ask, ask all these questions, so it's a bit of a lottery which ones I pick up. Um, he says, a rather big question, if I may. If we can all accept that climate change is the greatest issue face, facing humanity, what do you regard as the next in terms of its global significance? And why is that your view? I mean, do you th is it right climate change is 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 the the big killer i mean you spent your life in cancer uh, to some extent haven't you um what do you what do you think where where are we headed paul well i think yeah i um what was that quote predicting the future is tough um i think it was a baseball player um somewhere in the us but anyway um so i i don't like predicting the future or not the far future for sure climate change is a very significant issue we do have to do something about it I'm always optimistic that we will um, get together politically in the world and also um, use science to find solutions. It's been slow um, coming about, but I think now the denialists have been seen off really. And um, it's just a question of, of um, how quickly we can get things going. I mean, after that and, not, and sort of linked um, with it, of course, uh, several things, um, one, one has to be, of course, um, infectious disease. You know, we've seen how vulnerable our society is um, with coronavirus. And I mean, it, and we could have more deadly, um, we could have more de deadly pathogens, um, which would be extremely difficult to manage. So this is a wake up call. I mean, how we deal with pathogens um, as a society and we and we I mean we were woefully woefully um, even unprepared for that and I mean it's unforgivable that we were um, we were unprepared um, but of course the world seems to have been unprepared e e except for more authoritarian states that just um, like China itself which just insisted on um, you know really 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 rigorous social conditions from the very beginning to control it so I'd say uh, pandemics I, I think food and water sustainability um, is uh, something that we need to be careful about because um, um, the population is still growing. We still have um, significant poverty in the world. So uh, if we're going to feed the world and do it in a sustainable way and also protect our environment, I think um, that's going to require quite a lot of, of work too. So I think those are those, that, 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 those are the two I would add to climate change, and of course are impacted on by climate change. And and do you think the politicians are up to this? I mean, we've got COP twenty six looming up. By the way, uh, this is a good chance for me to give a plug for our RSM climate change series. We've got ten programs. You can look at them on RSM Live. Some fantastic uh, Prince Charles. Uh, helped us with the very first broadcast, but we've got some fantastic speakers on that. But um, yeah, are the politicians up to the job in terms of you know, is there is there going to be enough cooperation, collaboration to deal with these? These are not an issue even America or China can deal with. I mean, we're going to have to get together, aren't we? 
Well, the point is, and you put your finger on it, I mean, it's, uh, it requires a world solution. And um, the, the reason the climate change denialists were so vociferous is that it reflects a, a political um, positioning which does not like top-down interference. Um, uh, um, you know, the, the sort of um, um, extreme um, liberalism that you see in the United States that nobody tells any individual what to do and governments should be small is not the way that one is going to um, deal with problems like climate change. So we've got to get to a mature political position that this is a major problem, that um, that, uh, the, that those who are against it are just against what they are against is the sorts of things one has to do to push it back. And we, we, we see that in, in, in spades and that's, that's being uh, uh, obvious. And it will require a world, a coordinated world solution and then then we have the problems that um that uh, that we are we put demands on all these different societies and in different stages so we have china and india for example who um are desperate to grow their economies and they're using fossil fuels to do it and so contributing to the problem um whilst already we have massive fossil fuels and the us even higher and it, it's politically immensely complicated because to, to stop China, say, developing or India developing um, is, is obviously a problem. Yet we've got to have to some sort of control. So this is an immensely difficult problem, combined with the fact that it's always over the horizon, 30 years away, 40 years away, 50 years away, before the catastrophes really happen. Although, um, you know, when we look at all the flooding now, you do sort of um, realise things are happening. And uh, politicians work on a much shorter cycle, four years, five years, I mean, eight years, maybe. And it does need political leadership to take us through. It. I do think we can achieve it. I don't think it's easy. It does require world government. It does require people to be brave, our political leadership to be brave. It does require um, scientists in particular to contribute to the solutions. I think we will solve it, um, but I think it will be a very tough journey. Great. I, I can't resist reading this one out. This is from Bruce Varley. He says, Sir Paul, part of your schooling was at the County Grammar School for Boys in Harrow, where you were an active member of the Dramatic Society. As a senior prefect there, you might remember Batman and Robin, a big change to your subsequent scientific career. <laughs> I don't think that needs an answer, but there's another one from... Uh, no, Henry. but the name is very familiar. And just say <laughs> hello. Yes. <laughs> so, so Paul says, hi, Bruce. You'd be pleased with that, I'm sure. OK, Henrietta Bowden-Jones, a newly elected trustee to the Royal Society of Medicine, which is a great honour, of course. Not quite the same as being president of the Royal Society, I have to say. But anyway, it's an honour. Uh, she says, a psychological question here. You've met many Nobel Prize winners. What personality traits would you say are shared by you and those other recipients i mean what singles you out paul and and the other you know watson and crick and the other sort of superstars of science i'd say we're a pretty odd lot if you, i think the common feature is oddness um if i can so let's just take that nothing more to be said there um i think uh on the scientific side for sure uh, um a very, for many, a very high level, even a passion for curiosity of just wanting to know how things work and a, a total focus on single problems, which is what makes us a bit odd. Yeah. And you, yeah, you have quoted, I, I can't remember where, you talked about scientific honesty as opposed to sort of political blah, blah, you know, boosterism and bluffism and whatever politicians do to get to the top, especially the populists that we've uh, we've got around at the moment, although thank God Mr. Trump has gone. Oh, I'm not, actually not supposed to be political in, in the RSM. But um, yeah, I mean, just a word on that. I mean, why is science in your mind, you know, the way ahead? Um, well, I think, you know, it's the enlightenment really, you know, rationality, um, adherence to evidence, um, pursuit of truth or uh, you know I'm, I'm sounding hopelessly idealistic 
but um, that's what we need to solve the main problems. And we see it in, the, uh, you mentioned the word populism, um, because in, in the era of social media and so on, populist opinions without evidence can take root. And um, we do need a very rigorous, a very um, adherence to, to truth and honesty in approaching things. I mean, science, of course, is, is a difficult, I mean, one shouldn't be misled and think that everything scientists do is correct, because it isn't. I mean, I, I often use the word tentative knowledge to describe things, particularly when something new comes up, like the coronavirus, you're, you're wandering around in the dark, in the murk. And, uh, um, and when I, I mean, my lab is next to there, and I spend most of my time there confused, bewildered, and um, not knowing really what on earth all this stuff means. And so it's tentative knowledge that gets better and more established the more it survives repeated testing. But uh, science we teach at school is sort of chiseled on stone, you know, Newton's laws of motion or whatever. Uh, Nobel's, going back to it, have often wrestled for quite a few years with tentative knowledge and wandering around in, in the fog. And that requires a, a, an intensity and a curiosity that can overcome all those, all those problems. Mm, that's, good, that's a good answer. Um, <laughs> let's come back a little bit to you because, you know, you, you mentioned you've got a flat in Clerkenwell, you work in, in W1 um, in the Crick Institute. You, you've got a house in Summertown, really nice part of North Oxford, just mm. north of the, what used to be the old Radcliffe Hospital. And then your Chancellor um, out west. So where's your heart? Is it London? Is it Oxford? Is it um, Bristol? I mean, tell, well, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I've lived uh, in quite a few places in my life, even in the UK. I went to my first university. I couldn't get into a university, actually. I mean, it's another story. Um, it, was, it was Birmingham. And so, I, you know, I've lived in, 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 in Birmingham. I went to um, Norwich to do my PhD. I was born there, of course. Um, Edinburgh, um, Brighton in the University of Sussex, which I'd love to stay, but I couldn't get a job there either. Um, but London is probably the place where I do feel at home. But having a house in Oxford, it's like I'm so privileged. You know, it's like having a, you know, an apartment in town and a house in the country in Oxford. And uh, it, that, that's a really quite a, a good a good combination. Uh, but I am very interested in all of the UK, in, including um, uh, uh, um, Scotland and other uh, Ireland and Wales, and Northern Ireland and Wales. And so I, I, I don't feel particularly sort of regional, but I'm probably most at home in London. Yeah. And tell us a bit about your family. Are you married to Anne? You've got two daughters, right? Uh, yeah. And they're, they're pretty successful, aren't they, in different ways? Yes, they are. I'm, I'm very proud of them. My, um, my wife, Anne, is a teacher, teacher of small children. Um, she retired when we went to New York. Um, and um, we had two daughters. Um, one, Sarah, is a, um, a TV editor for ITV Sports. And in fact, if you watch the Euros... Um, yes, definitely, yeah. But, uh, and if you watch it on ITV, she will have been um, in, in control of a number of those matches that you would have seen. Yeah, yeah. So she was in charge of the entire thing there. I, I went to see her once when she was doing, um, uh, when she was much younger, doing action replays. I couldn't imagine a more stressful job. You know, what would happen is um, the editor, what she is now, would suddenly shout out action replay. And she had 20 screens in front of her and <laughs> was choosing them um, about three seconds before it goes to the pundits and out to the entire world. Really <laughs> stressful. So that's her job. So she's a media lovey. And then my other da daughter is a, a full professor in high energy physics at University College London with her experiments in CERN in the, um, in the um, large um, proton collider. So wow. she's an academic and scientist in the physical sciences. And one is, um, the other one is a media person. And you've got some grandchildren as well? I've got four grandchildren, three four-year-old boys and one seven-year-old um, daughter. I'm, the four-year-old boys are a bit of a handful, to be perfectly honest. I try to slope off with my granddaughter so we can have ice creams and go to the local museum, and that's sort of working pretty well. 
<laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. So, um, and and we haven't. We're running out of time. Actually, a few more minutes. But I mean, COVID. Um, how, that must have affected your lab. You, um, you have you you've been able to carry on work at the yes Institute? we have i i mean what we decided very very early on um march um february march we had these discussions last year was that um the government plans to put up these big lighthouse labs to do the testing and testing was going to be crucial until we knew something more about the virus and got vaccine um that was never going to work in time to have an any impact on the first wave and it didn't I mean, as, as we saw. So I switched um, the Crick into a testing laboratory and we, within three weeks, were doing 2000 tests a day. At the time it was 15, 20% of national capacity. I proposed actually at that time that they should roll that out with all of these academic labs that had closed. They should all do something and we could have um, uh, spread it out because we ended up supporting 10 North London hospitals and 150 care homes with a 24 hour turnaround using PCR. And that could have, that I think would have taken thousands of deaths off the, um, uh, the first wave. So we were, uh, um, uh, and there was an outcome that I'd like to, of this, of putting up the testing lab, which I'd like to say I thought of, but I didn't, and it, but it just fell out, was it course of course meant we could test our own staff as well. Right. So within a month, we were testing everybody and only letting those who were negative come into the building. So we have been almost 100% capacity since the beginning. There was just a month at the beginning when we were low, and mostly we've been operationally um, at 100%. And then in the last uh, six months, we, we set up a vaccination centre as well, and we've been doing about 1,000 a day for that as well. Well, this is, this is another political question. I mean, it, it hasn't been handled that well, has it? I mean, immensely difficult problem, but I mean, in a way, what you're really saying is that with, with enough testing, people could have carried on much more rather than be locked away for effectively 18 months. You know, people have been over sheltered probably, haven't they? They could have, what would you have done differently if you'd yeah. been, actually something saying, would you would you accept the job of prime minister if you were offered it? They Well, you know, it, it, let, let's be honest, it was, it's tough for the politicians and it's tough for the scientists advising the politicians. And I do think that the, it hasn't been done brilliantly, though it's difficult to look at it, most places in the world where, uh, which it, where, where on the whole, it hasn't been done brilliantly. I think that, um, I think the scientists, made mistakes, or obviously they would. It, it, I don't think we can just blame all, all the politicians. I think the testing actually was the biggest mistake, if you want my honest opinion, because the vaccine yeah, yeah. thing did actually get going, but the testing and tracing hasn't worked. And um, I would dearly like to know quite how it was all put together because um, what was dreamt up was not dreamt up by the politicians. It was dreamt up by scientific advisors. And I don't really know who did it. And um, I think that will eventually emerge. But the idea that you could put a testing together on large sites that had never operated this way and have a, an effective um, um, a, 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 a testing regime that would, could support um, local places within weeks is just an utter nonsense. I mean, we, we could solve all our problems because we just picked the telephone up or walked down the street to sort it. You can't do that if you've got something in Milton Keynes and testing in Warsaw. I mean, it just isn't going to work. So it was a, it was a big, big mistake. And I, I'm not seeing anybody putting their hands up to saying um, who, who suggested it. A big and expensive mistake. Um, well, we, we better not end on a negative. Let's end on a positive because mm. there's been quite a few questions coming in about, you know, the future of science and how we attract um, more people, maybe more in inclusive, more uh, uh, more women, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what, what words do you have for the, the uh, quite a lot of young people, you know, student, university students, medical students, et cetera, watch these uh, in conversations. What, what, what words of, of encouragement do you have for them, Paul? Science is a fantastic activity. It's not for everybody. It is, uh, you know, you, you fail a lot if you're doing important stuff, um, but it is immensely satisfying. All I can say about myself is I have been paid all my life to satisfy my own curiosity. I mean, it, it is an extraordinary privilege to be a scientist. If, you've got, if you like it, if you can cope with failure um, and um, you enjoy it and you have some capability, 
do it. Um, don't compete, you know, it's not competition, that isn't what it is. It's discovering truth. It's a high calling. It's a fantastic thing to do. Great, well, that, that's, that's a great message. I think, I mean, two words I think I'm gonna use to sum you up, Paul. I, th I think you are a national treasure. How about that? <laughs> We'll put you better add that to your CV. Um, so thank you so much. I better let you go. Um, you, you've been working late uh, in the office talking to us. So thank you so much. Just before you do, a few announcements. Um, tomorrow we've got one of our trustees, Claire Bainton, interviewing Hugh Montgomery. Hugh Montgomery is probably the doctor with the highest profile in climate change, and they'll be talking about COVID, climate change, and the and the risk of further pandemics. And then. Uh, uh, the week after that, in our Thursday uh, session, start at 12.30 in the morning, um, we've got Sir Michael Marmot, who's at University College London, and you know he's Mr. Inequality and all the issues around inequality. And they'll be talking about COVID and inequality and why people in, in, in the lower social strata have been so much more badly, I didn't say that very well, uh, they have been worse impacted I, even then I've got it wrong, um, but you know what I mean. Um, and then uh, on this program, we're taking a bit of a break. We take a two week break. And then on the 11th of August, we've got Dame Parveen Kumar, who's done amazing things um, uh, in medicine. And she'll be talking about her career growing up in India and then making such a success of her career here in London. So Paul, I, it's been fantastic to talk to you. I, it's a a privilege to talk to a national treasure so you can go off and have a, a glass of wine now and relax and and feel good about uh, yourself and about all the amazing achievements so thank you so much and goodbye to everybody don't forget the royal society of medicine needs your donations i don't think we we're quite in the same league as the uh, crick institute uh, but we need your help uh, in order to keep going especially in these covid ridden times and do come to number one wimpole street uh, do consider joining the RSM and good night uh, and have a great evening, Paul. Thank you. Thank bye, you. everybody. Bye bye.